New York in the beautiful Adirondack Mountains. My sister lives here in a quaint little town called Scroon Lake, New York. And we're actually overlooking Scroon Lake. And the sun just came up. And there's a beautiful fog to kind of rest over the mountains here and beautiful Scroon Lake. So I'm excited to bring you on my family vacation. And I'm excited to be able to share tonight's message, actually this morning, it's early in the morning. I'm praying that uh, no one's going to come down here and disturb us during our video cast. But uh, we're going to have a good time. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for my precious friends that are watching. Lord, I prepared myself and I ask you, Lord, that you would come in a special way in the Adirondack Mountains, in Scroon Lake, New York. And Father, I pray in Jesus' name that your spirit would be strong and great. Father, my dependency is upon you. Hide me behind your cross that you would receive the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. So welcome. Welcome to the video, the webcast today. I'm excited that you're here, and I believe God's going to do something special in our midst. I'm actually going to be sharing my testimony with you today, asking the Lord that He would do something very special, that He would heal broken hearts, that He'd give people fresh focus, that they begin to see Jesus in a new way. So let's share the story. I was raised a preacher's kid, a PK, but most people called me a PB, a preacher's brat. And I probably deserved that because I was such a rambunctious child. I was always in the back pew, and I was always like making little planes and throwing them in church, or, you know, doing spit wads, or doing something that I shouldn't do. And sometimes when my dad was preaching, he would have to embarrass me and say, Son, come up here, and I'd have to make the long walk from the back of the church, or halfway, all the way to the front and sit on the stage with my dad while he was preaching. So I learned to be respectful in church. And uh, because I was a preacher's kid, I was the third generation pastor on both sides of my family. My father was a pastor, then his, his mother was also a minister, and uh, she would go into the inner city of New York City with all the drunks, all the alcoholics, the drug, act, drug addicts, and she'd win them to the Lord. She was a Bible school teacher, professor. She also pastored a church at one time, so she was heavily involved in ministry, the sweetest lady you ever want to meet. On the other side, my grandfather was an Amish man, and he had the whole buggy, he had the whole hat, everything, and uh, he, he had a drinking problem, he did a lot of stuff, and, and a Pentecostal lady, day after day, kept on going to his house and just witnessing to him and one day he gave his heart to the Lord and I praise God that he did or I wouldn't be here today my mother would have married an Amish man and never have met my father and I wouldn't have been here and so he got saved he was Mennonite for a while he went to a Gerald Durstein tent crusade he's located down in Bradenton Florida but he brought a big tent to Burton Ohio and uh, he was actually uh, my grandfather was in Middlefield Ohio but a Burton Ohio big tent crusade and uh, with tears coming down his face, he just totally surrendered everything to the Lord, studied, and became a Pentecostal preacher. And then also, and he started a church, planted a church, pastored for years until his death. Also, my mother also uh, is a, a mighty teacher of the Lord, has great insight on the scriptures, heavily involved in ministry with my father. And so I have all these preachers all over my family, and I said at a very young age, no way, Jose, am I ever going to be a preacher. I am not going to go into the ministry. There's no way. And so I, uh, I thought to myself, well, maybe, um, you know, I'll think about doing something. But, you know, maybe go into video. I always wanted to be into movies. I used to write church plays. I love drama and acting, things like that. But I don't know if I'll go into ministry. And, and my life didn't make any sense anyways. So, you know, I probably won't go into ministry. But when I was 18 years old, my mom just calmly suggested one day, well, why don't you go to Bible school and at least pray? I didn't have the money to go to a, a secular college, but I went to a small little college in upstate New York, in the mountains, kind of like here, not in fact only a couple hours from here, called Pinecrest Bible Training Center. And so I decided that I was, that's what I was going to do. I was just going to go to Bible school and pray, maybe for nine weeks, maybe a year at the most, and I'll just pray and see what God wanted me to do. And so I headed for upstate New York, a little little town, one 
one light town called Salisbury Center, New York, and uh, just began to pray, God, what do you want me to do? And little to my amazement, God began to just pour out His Spirit upon me, and I spent so much time my first year on my face before the Lord, either in a chapel service or in my room, especially in my room, and the Lord began to whisper in my ear, I've called you to preach. I said, Lord, me a preacher? That's my dad. That's not me. You see, my life didn't make any sense up until that time, and there's no way that I felt like I could ever be a preacher. And so I, I thought, how can I do it? But day after day, the Lord began to whisper in my ear, I've called you to be a preacher. I'll never forget when I surrendered it all to the Lord. I said, Lord, I'll do anything you want me to do if you'll equip me to do it. And I knew that's what God wanted me to do, was to go into the ministry. And so I spent a lot of time on my face before the Lord, asking Him that He would give me an anointing to be able to speak and be able to win people to Jesus. But my life didn't make any sense. And let me explain why. I said I was raised a preacher's kid, and I was very hyperactive. And even in the first grade, I never would hold still. And because of that, my teacher thought that I had a learning disability. And this learning disability, I really didn't have. I was really hyperactive, but because I was so hyper, I didn't apply myself to learn. Well, anybody that knows anything about the LD classes, the learning disability classes, know this, that these are the kids that are made fun of. These are the kids that, uh, that kind of don't fit in with the rest of them. So even at a young age, I began to be made fun of and say, oh, you're stupid, you're a retard. And you know that little saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me? That's the biggest lie that's ever been said. Because sticks and stones would break my bones, but my bones would heal. But the words that were said to me over my spirit at a very young age, these words stuck in my spirit. And my self-esteem at a very young age, second, third, fourth grade, going into fifth grade, these words being made fun of as a small child stuck in my spirit and my self-esteem went to zero. I didn't believe in myself. Well, I thought things would change once I got into junior high, but now it just wasn't words. Now I was being picked on. Now I was being beat up. And day after day, I was being beat up. Day after day, I was being spit at in the face. Day after day, I was being slammed up against the lockers. I'll never forget, always on my bus, I would sit about the middle because all the front seats were always taken by the time they got to my bus stop. And I used to pray and say, God, please let no one bother me today. And almost every day, they would rip me out of my seats and they would take books. I'll never forget one day, it was worse than other days. They took big books and slammed it over my head and they spit at me in the face and they shoved me up against the seats and they said, you are stupid. You will never amount to anything. You are stupid, you are a retard. I'll never forget as I wiped the spit off my face and began to cry and run toward my house that those words, they had such a deep effect upon me. After that, the bus driver put me in the front seat. He reserved a front seat for me. And when he got to my bus stop, he would hold back all the kids and he would say, run. I was kind of like Forrest Gump. Run, Porter, run. And he would tell me to run. And I'd run just as fast as I can. And as I ran, I would dodge the spit coming from the windows because the windows were down and they would spit at me. And I'd dodge the spit and I'd run just as fast as I can. And a couple times he didn't hold them back fast enough and they chased me down. As I got about halfway home, they chased me down, they jumped on top of me, they smashed my face in the dirt, and they began to spit on me some more and beat on me, and began to say, you are stupid, you'll never amount to anything. I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And I'll never forget just going home and just going into my room, shutting the door, and just weeping, saying, Lord, I don't have a real close relationship with you like my parents do, but why is this happening to me? I just didn't understand. Every day he would hold them back. Every day I'd run to my house. Every day I dodged the spit. It just didn't get any better. I remember sitting next to the most prettiest girl in the whole middle school. She actually sat next to me and she was just staring at me one day. I was in class, she was just staring at me. And I didn't know why she was staring at me. I thought maybe, maybe I'm not so bad after all. After all, she's staring at me. So maybe I'm not so bad. She just stared at me, was looking at me, and then she goes, you're ugly. And when she said, you're ugly, something inside of me was like a towel just twisted. I thought, why am I not accepted by anyone? Why does everybody hate me? 
I had very few friends. I was last to be chosen for everything in gym class. You know, you always had to have a partner or something. I was last to be chosen on every team. I was ignored. I sat alone during lunch most of the time. Had very few friends, just a couple friends that were really, really weird, <laughs> that nobody else liked. The, 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 the nerdiest kids in the whole school, and a couple of them would embrace me, and even them made fun of me as well. So I thought, okay, maybe it's going to be different in high school. I'll never forget my junior high graduation, getting ready to go into high school, and all the parents were there, all the students were there, because this was going to be a time where they gave you a diploma, and uh, it congratulated you for completing junior high, 6th through 8th grade, getting ready to push you into high school. And they called each name. And after each name, every single student got up there and everybody clapped. Everybody clapped. Everybody cheered. Everybody just had a, a big old hoopla for every person. I remember sitting in my chair and they calling my name, Steve Porter. And as they called my name and as I walked across the platform, up the stairs and across the platform to get my diploma, I was booed by the entire student body. There was only a few clapping of a few parents, and everyone was looking around saying, why is this kid being booed? I never felt so humiliated in my life. I was so humiliated. I was so embarrassed. And I sat in my seat with my diploma, and I felt like I was the loneliest man, loneliest boy in all the earth. I thought, maybe even God has forgotten me. This is terrible. Why am I going through this? Why was I booed? Why was I humiliated? People were laughing at me. I sat down with my diploma and I went into ninth grade. Ninth grade, it continued. In the beginning of the year, my science teacher said, I want you to choose a desk partner. Everybody choose a desk partner. Of course, I was always last to be chosen for everything. So nobody wanted to be my desk partner. Everyone had a partner but me and one other kid. And the teacher said, we'll call him John. John, you be his desk partner. And I thought to myself, well, at least I have somebody. And he threw the biggest fit that you have ever seen. I mean, he just threw a fit. He said, I don't want to be his desk partner. Why do I have to be with him? I hate him. I don't want to be his desk partner. And the teacher is just like, too bad, John. You're his desk partner. So he made it his mission every single day to, to, to just bombard me with persecution, I guess you could call it. He elbowed me and knocked the wind out of me. He would, uh, he, would, he would spit on me. He would push me. Whenever the teacher wasn't looking, he would make fun of me. He'd slap me in the back of the head every single day. And I remember just sitting there thinking to myself, why do I have to have him as a desk partner? Why could I have one person, one person in my class that would sit next to me and treat me like a human being? Why? One day, it got it quiet. The teacher was making a point. It got quiet. And he yelled in front of everyone, he stinks. He smells. And of course, this was a lie. My mother always made good sure that I was zestfully clean. But he just wanted to humiliate me again. He wanted to embarrass me. And the whole class burst with laughter. Everybody was laughing. And my teacher was, going, was trying not to laugh as well. He was bursting. He was laughing as well. I just sat there. I thought, this is terrible. Why do I have to have this life? Why? Well, my parents moved, and I thought, this is the best day of my life. I moved out of that town, and I moved to another town, the town where my dad had been pastoring for the last five years. They had bought a house there in this new town, and my parents decided to put me in Christian school. So I thought, you know, Christian school, it's going to be better. Well, the physical abuse, for the most part, stopped. But by that time, I was in... Uh, the third or uh, the second quarter of ninth grade, my self-esteem was at, at zero, so much to the point where I didn't know how to act. I was so shy, I was so withdrawn that I tried to put on as many different personalities as, as I could to be accepted. I tried to be a prep, but I'd put my collar up with the little alligator, you know, back in the 80s. And I thought, you know, the preps would accept me. I wasn't accepted. I tried to be a punk and have chains and stuff on me, and that wasn't accepted. I tried to be a nerd. I brought a briefcase to school, and I would sit with the other nerds thinking that I'd be accepted there, but I wasn't accepted there. No matter what personality that I tried to be, tried to dramatize, 
I wasn't accepted by any of those personalities. And I was flunking out of Christian school. I had very few friends, very few people. Most people were annoyed by me, and I probably deserved it because I just didn't know how to act. I was very immature, and I was just flunking out. So my parents said, we're going to take him out of Christian school now. He's not making it. He's never going to graduate high school this way, and we're going to homeschool him. So my mother, God bless my blessed mother, she took me out, and every single day she began to say to me, Steve, you're more than a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. You could do all things through Christ. I said, no, I can't. I'm stupid. She goes, no, you're not stupid. You have the mind of Christ. I said, oh, I can't learn. Yes, you can learn. Through Christ, you can learn. You can thrive, not just survive. You can do everything that you put your mind to do through Christ Jesus, who gives you the grace and the strength. And every day, she spoke the Word of God to me. Every day, she began to renew my mind with the Word of God. And I thought to myself, Maybe I can learn. I began to apply myself. I began to believe the scripture, what the word of God said over me, rather than what people said. I began to apply myself. And to my amazement, I graduated high school with special honors, straight A's. Straight A's. And I graduated, and I began to apply myself and began to learn. And it's only because of my mother who began to speak the word of God into me and began to believe in me. And there was no one next to me to say, you're a loser. My mother spoke and said, you are, you are a succeeder. You're a champion. You can do all things through Christ who, who gives you strength. And so here I was, now going to Bible school. And to my amazement, in Bible school, I was very well liked. I had lots of friends. The Lord began to do a healing work that couple years that I had. I had two years in homeschooling, two years in the Christian school, two years in homeschooling. Those two years in homeschooling, God did a healing work on my heart. And I began to be the real Steve. And when I was the real Steve, I was accepted by my friends in upstate New York. I began to be very well liked by people. And I was amazed by it that I was accepted. And God began to just give me a new personality. I began to be me. Just whoever God created me to be. And, and when I was in Bible school, when I graduated, they chose a person to represent the class. It was kind of a valedictorian, but was more a, a person who was a Christian spiritual example. Someone who God did a great work in their heart during the school year. And uh, to my amazement, I was chosen my last year of Bible school to be to represent my graduating class. And when I got up there, I'll never forget, I had flashbacks of junior high being booed and humiliating and sitting there with my eyes closed. And I'll never forget, as I said, Steve Porter, come up. And I walked up to the podium to give my speech. My whole class stood up. The whole auditorium stood up. There were 200 people that were clapping for me, cheering. And when I stood up to the pulpit, I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed. And what did I talk about? The only thing that I could think to talk about, and that was on the love of God. For God had taken me so far from a rejected kid who was flunking out of high school, flunking out of junior high. I was the most, probably the most least likely to succeed in my class in the Christian school. I was the most least likely to succeed. In fact, I remember one teacher said, I know who's going to be the greatest in this class and who's going to be the least likely to succeed. And he looked right over at me. So I was the most least likely to succeed. And here I was standing in front of 200 people giving a speech. God had taken me so far. When I was 16 years old, I took my very first missionary trip. And I went to Zambia, Africa, in Zimbabwe. And we were there for two months, almost two and a half months. And we trained for it for, for 10 days in Missouri. And we went to Africa. And I loved this trip because I was, nobody knew me at 16 years old. And so when I was 16, I just, most of the team liked me. And uh, I was having a great time. We were building a house for a medical assistant. We were also uh, in churches doing our thing there with testifying and singing and and stuff and I would sing with the other ones. I just loved it. But about halfway through my trip, I got really, really sick. And I don't know what it was. We were in the depths, I mean the depths of Africa, in a little place called Mutanda Station in, in Zambia. And it was so deep. I mean, you literally, it took hours, days to get back there. And we were so deep into the, into the jungles. There were no really good hospitals or medical uh, doctors or anything like that. And so I was sick and I thought, well, hopefully I'll get better. 
Well, I got worse as the day progressed and then as the night progressed. And my fever went up to 104, 105, 105.6, continued to rise. And I was vomiting every five minutes. I was picking myself off my bamboo cot, going outside and throwing up. I'd go back and lay on my cot some more. And then I'd repeat that process over and over and over again. And then I began to be delirious. And my fever was, was, it was at a high. And I was so sick. I was so weak. I felt like I just couldn't get out of bed. But yet I'd have to drag myself out of bed, drag myself outside, and, and I would vomit. And while the nurse came in to check my, check my temperature again, and it had risen to 106. And I'll never forget my team. They were all outside my, my little shack that I was staying in. It was a shack that bats and stuff got in. And it, was, it was quite a story. And uh, they were all joined hands and they prayed that God would touch my body. Well, the missionary, he's gone on to be with the Lord. His name is Harvaki. And uh, he brought me and he was friends with my dad. And he, he, brought, he came into that little shack that I was seeing. He had big hands. I'll never forget the big hands that he had. And he laid his hands upon me. And he began to say, in the name of Jesus, I command healing into his body. Either God was going to heal me or I was going to die. I was in the depths of Africa. I had a 106 degree fever. I, I knew something was wrong. I was delirious. I was dehydrated. All kinds of stuff was wrong with my body. And he laid his hand upon me, commanded healing into my body. And instantly I was healed. Instantly I was healed. My temperature went down. And the next day I was on my feet and I was out the door. So God is a miracle working God. He healed me in the boonies of Africa. And an interesting part of that story is at that exact moment that I was sick on death's door, God woke my mother up. She went to the church and uh, she prayed for five hours straight. She would not, she had no idea that anything was wrong. We had no message to her. She didn't know, but God spoke to her. God spoke to her that her child was in danger and that she was to pray. So, you know, never doubt the, the, the power of a praying mother, my friend, because God spoke to my mother to pray and she faithfully prayed for five hours straight that her child would be fine and God spared my life. Praise God for praying mothers. I'm telling you what, if it wasn't for my mother, I wouldn't be standing here today. She believed in me when no one else believed in me. She prayed for me when no one else would even pray. She believed that God had a purpose and a plan for my life. And I used to remember walking past her door at a young age, and I would see her on her knees as she'd be praying for me. She'd say, God, I ask that you would use my son, that you would put a call upon his life. I still remember her praying. I still remember her weeping on her knees with her Bible open, praying for me. Never doubt the power of a praying mother. Amen? Amen. God is good. Thank God for praying moms. Moms, never give up on your kid. No matter how it looks, no matter what statistics say, pray for your child and God will honor the tears of a praying mother. The tears of a praying mother, God will never ignore, my friend. The tears of a praying mother, God will always hear and He'll always answer. Don't grow weary in well-doing. That's for somebody. Praise God. Well, on the end of my trip, we decided to take a white water rafting trip. I shared the story in other messages, but this is my complete story. Some of you will be watching it for the first time, so I'm going to repeat the story. But it was a white water, white water rafting trip, and it was on the Zambezi River. And this was kind of a dangerous river. It was known for its impetuous current. It had about uh, somewhere between 8 and 10 foot waves, and I'm not exaggerating. And those that know uh, Zambia, Africa, so maybe somebody is watching the webcast, from Zambia, Africa, you know all about that river. It's a very, very dangerous river. And here I was going to pay $20 to go whitewater rafting. I was crazy. I don't know. But all my friends were going. Everybody on my team was going, so I was going to go. And I remember hearing a story before I went. You know all those encouraging people like to tell you stories. Of an uncle and a father and a little boy went on a dugout canoe down the same river. And they hit some currents and they overturned. And the father and the uncle went to one side and the little boy went to the other side. Well, when the little boy realized that he was separated from his father and his uncle, he decided to swim across, and halfway across the crocodiles got him, ate him. So, here I was on the same river, stopped for lunch, so far so good. Crocodiles were sunning themselves on the rocks, literally sitting there on the rocks, eating our lunch away from the crocodiles. Got back in the boat. Well, 
When we were on the boat, when the waves would hit us, our team leader, the one in charge, would say, jump to the left side of the boat. And we'd jump to the left side. And he'd say, jump to the right side. And I'd jump to the right side. We'd all jump to the front. We'd all jump to the back. Wherever he told us to jump, we'd even out the boat, and we'd somehow make it through these mountains of water. I remember asking him, when we stopped for lunch, I said, is there crocodiles in the river ahead? Is there crocodiles in this river? And he ignored me. You know you're in trouble when your team leader won't answer your question. He wouldn't answer my question. I was like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, why won't he answer me? But yet, I knew something was, you know, up. And finally, he uttered out something like, well, yeah, but don't worry about it. And, and anyways, we got to focus on what's ahead. And we're getting ready to hit the second to the last set of rapids. And I uh, just wanted to let you know that every, like, 12 to 15 raps overturn but it hasn't happened to us. It's the luck of the draw. It hasn't happened to us in a long time. We'll make it through and we'll be fine. So I remember one of the only times I ever as a kid said, Lord, I'll do anything, but please protect me. I'll even be a preacher if you want me to. But please protect me. Lord, remember that prayer. <laughs> but uh, I said, Lord, please protect me. And I used my dad's uh, title in church as uh, hopefully a little leverage with the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm a preacher's kid. Please spare me, God. You know, I was so nervous. I was so scared. My sister, I have a twin sister, and uh, we're was visiting her right now in Screw Lake. And uh, she was there, and uh, she was praying as well. And we got into the raft, and we hit, about a half hour down, we hit the second to the left, last set of rapids. He said, jump to the left side. And we jumped to the left side. He said, jump to the right. We jumped to the right. And a surprise wave came and loomed from behind us and launched me straight up in the air. While well, raft overturned, we were all thrown, and everybody was thrown to the right side of the boat except for me. I was thrown to the left side, and everybody on the right side of the boat, including my sister, all swam to shore. No problem. They were fine. I was on the left side, and I was caught in, in a little tidal, tidal I, don't, I can't even remember what you call them, an under pool. I was sucked deep underneath the water. I was in total blackness. I saw nothing but black, murky water. And I felt like I was going deeper and deeper and deeper. And sometimes I've heard that you can get confused if you go deep enough which way is up and which way is down. I felt like my lungs were going to burst. And finally, I kept on swimming and swimming. Finally, I came to the surface. I was gasping for breath and coughing and gasping. But now, I was going through all of these rapids with uh, just my life preserver on. Thank God for life preservers. Wear those if you go out on boats, please. That, that's for free. Wear those. And so I was going through all these rapids with just my life preserver on. Just my life preserver. Being thrown all over, coughing, water going down my throat. And finally it shot me into calm water. And now you say, oh, praise God, you're in calm water. Thank God, you're in calm water. Isn't that wonderful? But now the crocodiles love the calm water. That's where they are, not in the tidal waves. They're, they're in the calm water. So I was in the calm water just bobbing there, looking like a floating hot dog, looking like a happy meal for a crocodile. And I was praying, oh, I was praying. I saw a boat way in the distance. I was praying, Lord, please spare my life. Please let not a crocodile come and get me. Please, Lord. I was petrified. I know exactly how it is to be petrified for your very life. And uh, I was very nervous. And so finally, someone came and pulled me out of the water, put me in that boat. One boy had hypothermia and my life was spared. Well, after that missionary trip, people said to me when I got back home, God's not called you to the mission field. Ain't called you to the nation, son. Maybe you shouldn't go. This should be a sign to you that you're not called to go. But when I was 18 years old, I felt like the Lord laid upon my heart that I was to go to India. And I said, well, Lord, if you want me to go, you have to supply the money because I don't have the money. I just don't have the money. Well, God worked a miracle for me to go to Africa. The last minute, we didn't have the money, and he supplied. So I said, if God's a God of supplying, who he guides, he provides, who he leads, he feeds, what he orders, he pays for. So if this is the Lord, he's going to supply. Well, to my amazement, he supplied, and there I was in India. Now, this trip was a lot different than the Africa trip. This was a preaching trip. And I said to my team leader, as I rose up to be the one to speak, we all had to take turns to speak, I looked back at him, I said, so how long should this be? And he said, oh, about 30 minutes. I about died. I thought, 30 minutes? There's no way that I could speak 30 minutes. I said, maybe five minutes. He said, just do the best that you can. And I was petrified. And he was standing next to me. He was my interpreter. 
and I just began to say, um, uh, yeah, 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 uh, can you imagine how that sounded through an interpreter? Um, 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 stuttering through, through an interpreter? I mean, how lousy is that? And that's all I could do is stutter and stammer. I, I was nervous. I was shaking. I was scared. I felt like I was going to pass out. And every time I got up there, one time, uh, I, I almost blacked out. And I had to sit down. And they said, demons jumped on me. All the Indian pastors said, demons jumped on you. And uh, I, was, I was so scared. I don't know if it was demons. Maybe it was a spirit of fear. But it was something. I just could not speak, no matter how hard I tried. And you say, well, you were there all summer. Certainly you got better. Being there a whole month, you're going to get better. Right? Wrong. I got worse. The more I spoke, the more my words fell to the ground. I could not speak. And everyone began to talk. The Indian pastors began to talk. My team leaders began to talk. Everybody was like, well, why can't he speak? It's not that they were trying to be mean or anything. They just, they're perplexed. I mean, isn't he a preacher's kid? Why can't he speak? They just took it for granted that I'd have my dad's gift. Well, I couldn't do it. I couldn't speak, no matter how hard I tried. And then to make matters worse, I got really, really sick. And it got so bad that I had to be carried. And I remember my team leader had to pick me up and put, put me over his shoulder because I couldn't even take five steps without almost collapsing. I was so physically weak. And uh, put me over his shoulders, and I remember passing a wall of uh, Indian people, and they saw me, and they began to laugh at me, saying, why is that American boy? I mean, it was funny to them, and I could see why, because why would this, this white American boy be over the shoulder of this big Indian man? I mean, it looked kind of kind of crazy, but yet something was wrong with me. I didn't know. Well, it got worse. My health got worse, and uh, it got so bad that I was almost completely bedridden toward the end. And I remember standing in line to go to the doctor and thought, well, maybe you have uh, worms. I'll take this. And oh, we got a stomach ache. Take this. And oh, we should give you some blood. And I said, you're not giving me any blood. He goes, well, you're anemic. He says, but you need to take this. You need to take that. And you need to take this. I was popping all these pills. I didn't know what I was popping. And I wasn't getting any better. Then to make matters worse, a lot of people on my team thought that I was faking my sickness to get out of preaching. Because they knew that I didn't like to stand up there and speak. I thought, well, he's just trying to get out of washing dis dishes. He's trying to get out of not speaking. He's faking it. And so I just, it just bothered me. It really, really bothered me because I felt at 18 years old, I began to feel the same rejection that I felt as a kid. I remember spending a lot of time alone in my room. I'd shut the shutters, shut the door, stay in the dark, and sit there. During meal times, I didn't even want to come out because I felt rejected and I felt humiliated. I remember going into a bathroom and just crying my eyes out, saying, Lord, why would you take me here to India just to watch me fall? I feel so humiliated, I can't speak. I'm of no use, I'm sick. I could barely even walk. I could barely even walk five steps without having to sit down. I was so weak, I couldn't eat. I went to India weighing 160 pounds and I came home weighing 112. So that tells you something. 112 pounds coming home. I had lost a lot of weight. My bones were protruding out of my face. Bones all over. I, I barely was eating. I was dehydrated. And finally, the last day before it was time to go home, all my energy came back. The day that it was time for me to go home, all my energy came back. Now this just made everybody on my team just begin to believe. See, I told you he was faking it. I knew he was faking it. What would you think, though? I mean, in their defense, what would you think if I'm like, oh, I'm too sick to preach. I can't preach today, and it's time to go home, and I have my bag, and I'm like, let's go. <laughs> I have my bag on my shoulder to the airports, and got through the airports and everything. I believe it was God's supernatural grace and provision because I needed that energy. I couldn't even make five steps. I needed that energy to be able to get home. And so God gave me the energy. He gave me supernatural provision, a miracle, to be able to get me home. And finally, as I was getting ready to go home, a couple of my team members said, well, it was nice watching you lay in bed all summer, Steve. See ya. And I'll never forget those words. They just hurt me so deeply. And I began to see, see, I, maybe I am a loser. My mom spoke all this positive to me, but maybe I am a loser. And I came home, and I swore off missionary trips forever. And those same people, you know, Job's comforters, Job's friends, 
you're not called, you're not called, maybe you did something to make God mad, you know, all these people came, said you're not called to be a missionary, you're not called to do mission trips, you're not called to the nations, don't go to the nations, you just get sick there, maybe God's trying to tell you something, and, and I agreed with them, I said I'm never going to go again, well, now I'm in Bible school, getting ready to go, whoa, whoa, I forgot a big chunk of it here, let me, uh, let me backtrack for a second, so I'm really, really sick still, as um, soon as I got home, all the sickness comes back, and, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, what's going on? I had my strength for a couple days to get home, but now I'm, now, now I'm sick again. So what's going on with this? And my mom just kind of kept a close eye on me, and my sister slept on my floor and would get me water and help me to the restroom. I was very, very ill. And finally, my mom said, you know, we got to get him to a medical center. So they took me to a little medical center in my hometown of Madison, Ohio. And the little medical center, uh, as soon as they saw me coming, they immediately came up excuse me, came out, put blankets around me, helped me in. They laid me on this op operating table type of thing and put, I was shivering from head to toe, violently shaking. I was so cold. I lost so much weight, I was dehydrated. They put blankets over me to try to keep me warm and they took my blood pressure. And to my amazement, when they took my blood pressure, it was so low, they said, this can't be, and they tried to take it again. They said, we're going to have to get a machine, a computerized machine, to get an accurate reading. When they got the accurate reading, they said, we're surprised this boy is still alive. We can't believe that he's even here. How he made it home from India, we have no idea. And they said, he needs to go to a bigger hospital. And they took me by ambulance to Painesville, Ohio, to a much bigger hospital, Lake East. And as they began to work on me there, the doctors were scratching their heads. Like, we don't know what's wrong with him. We need to get him to a bigger hospital. So... They called a life flight and they life flighted me from Painesville to Cleveland to the University Hospital in Cleveland, Ohio, one of the best hospitals. And the doctors were, were still scratching their head, trying to figure out what was wrong with me. They said, well, we got to give him a bone marrow test. I'll never forget, my mom was there with me. My sister and my dad was out in the hallway and they were praying. And they did a bone marrow test and they had to insert a huge needle into my bone marrow and it was one of the most painful tests that you could go through. And as I laid there on that table and I injected that into my bone marrow to get that, get this, the white cells and red cells, platelets that they needed to get, I remember my mom just praying for me. And the doctor said I was one of the most calmest patients that they've ever seen. Just a peace just came over me. And God, God's hand was upon me even though that I was very, very ill and very, very sick. Well, they took me back to my room and I, the next morning, Two or three doctors came in, and it didn't look good. They uh, they had the sullen look on their face, and uh, they weren't smiling. They said, "Steve, we're sorry, but uh, you have aplastic anemia. Your bone marrow, which produces white cells, red cells, and platelets, it's a Sahara desert. Sahara desert. You don't have any, barely any. It's very, very low." I remember looking at the doctor and saying. Could I die from this? He said, yes, son. Yes, you could. And they turned and they walked out. My parents were out in the hallway and they were weeping. I still remember hearing my mom cry, my sister cry. They were people of faith, but their son was laying in an emergency room, an intensive care unit, hanging on for dear life. They gave my parents even a grimmer picture. And my parents refused to believe the report of man. And they said, we will, we will believe the report of the Lord and they put me on every prayer list that they could all across the nation people were praying from California to New York praying that God would spare the life of this young 18 year old boy I remember laying there thinking to myself in the hospital room Lord I remember hearing about these stories of cancer and leukemia and aplastic anemia I remember hearing these stories of these boys and these girls that perish from these diseases. Why me? Why me? I just, I just wanted to know. Why me? Why me? Why did I have to go through so many hard times in my life? This was not the first time that I almost lost my life. When I was a kid, I was on a bike and I got hit by a car on my bike and an angel of the Lord picked me off of my bike. Believe it or not, it's true. An angel of the Lord picked me off of my bike and set me on the grass. I've, I was in, walked out of car accidents time and time again. Times that I should have drowned or died. Even in car accidents, God spared my life. I don't have time to tell the whole story, but God spared my life many times. And now here I'm on my back again, 
hanging on for dear life saying, God, what's your plan in all this? I just don't understand. But people were praying. People were praying. My mom and dad were fasting, holding on to God. And two days later, the doctors came running into my room, holding on for dear life. Because they were so excited. And they came in and they said, Steve, we have never seen this in our entire medical career. In fact, we want your permission to put this in a magazine. But your bone marrow has completely reconstructed itself overnight. Then they said, to my amazement, your God, because I knew I was a believer, your God must be listening. Because you are a miracle story. God had healed my bone marrow overnight. My levels had gone through the roof. It's impossible. Even if my bone marrow had started again and was, and was better, it's impossible to have those kinds of levels overnight. But we know that God is a miracle working God. What had happened was I was lonely and I felt like I was the loneliest man on all the earth sitting there asking questions to God. And Jesus came walking into my hotel not my hotel, but my hospital room, and laid his hands upon me. And I didn't see him with my eyes, but I knew that he was there, and I knew that he loved me. He came to comfort me. He came in, and he laid his hands on me, and he healed me. He healed all my diseases. Amen. He healed me. And I was so thankful that God didn't forget about me, that God didn't reject me, but God loved me, and he cared about me. Well, after India, I said, no more missionary trips. No more not going again but here I'm in Pinecrest upstate New York studying to be a preacher now I'm into my second year God used me in a couple little exhortations but knew that I wasn't a preacher I couldn't preach couldn't speak I know I didn't have that ability but yet I have felt an impression on my heart that I was to go to Jamaica Jamaica man I love Jamaica I hope we got some Jamaicans watching because I love your country I've gone three times and I love I've been preaching from Montego Bay all the way to Ocho Rios and uh, been to Kingston and several places in uh, beautiful Jamaica, beautiful country. And uh, here I was in Jamaica, another preaching trip. And I still remember uh, I was the guest speaker of the night, petrified out of my mind. And I was at the bottom of a hill in a little place called Hamilton Mountain, which is not too far from Ocho Rios up into the mountains. And I was walking up this mountain, up this hill, and I saw the church way up on the hill that was lit. And I thought to myself, I have to speak tonight, Lord. And I'm not a preacher. I'm not a speaker. I don't even know if I'll be able to speak one minute. Last time I tried to speak, I couldn't speak. In India, it was an utter failure. It was, it was a disaster. India was a disaster of a trip for me. So I don't even know if I can. So as I walked up the hill, I said, I'm just going to leave it in your hands, God. And I walked into the church. The church was packed. It was packed. I mean, there were people everywhere, shoulder to shoulder. They were looking through the windows because they don't have glass in the windows. They have bars. They're looking through the bars at me. They were all over. They were in the foyer. They were going down the stairs. They were in the back room. They were, they were out in the parking lot. They were in the road. And to make matters worse, they had a huge speaker on top of the roof. And they had people sitting in their yards in lawn chairs. Lawn chairs sitting, waiting for the message of the hour. And then the bishop gets up and he says, and I love him. Oh, I love him greatly. Bishop Farrell was his name. He said, God has brought God's man of faith and power for the hour. And God's going to give him a message for us. And God's going to use them. And God's going to do this. And God's going to do that. I'm thinking to myself, thanks a lot. You're setting me up to watch me fall. I got a secret you don't know. That's what I was thinking. I'm not a preacher. No, no, no. I can't do this. And he said, Steve Porter, come on up, evangelist. Like, I'm no evangelist. And all these people are all spying. The Jamaicans are so lovely. Such an awesome people. I have to go back. Got to go back to Jamaica and preach. Love that place. They're beautiful people. They're smiling and, and just clapping their hands and so excited. And I went up to the pulpit and I put my hands on it. And I just wanted to do one thing. Rapture. I just wanted to disappear. I didn't even want to speak. But I knew I was up there. He had uh, announced me and I had to give a message. I opened my Bible. I didn't say anything. And then the first word that came to me was Jesus. So that's what I said. I said, Jesus. 
And as I said the word Jesus, that beautiful name of Jesus, I felt a literal fire come from the top of my head down to the soles of my feet and up again and out and I began to preach. I began to walk that stage and I began to preach. I could not believe it. I was quoting scripture verses that I've never learned. I was given revelation that no one taught me. I didn't even know where the stuff was coming from and I'm preaching and I'm thinking at the same time. I'm like, what am I doing? What am I doing? Where did you get that? I didn't ever memorize that scripture verse. And to my amazement, when I was done giving a message for almost 45 minutes, preaching nonstop under the fire and power of God, I gave an altar call and 25 people, many of them weeping. I said, why are these people crying? I, don't, I can't speak, but yet I'm preaching. And people are weeping and they're receiving Christ into their heart. And to my amazement, in that two-week trip, I led nearly a hundred people to Jesus in outdoor crusades, in tent meetings, in, uh, out in the streets, everywhere. I was preaching. I wanted to know if I could con continue to do it. Well, that fire has started then. It hasn't gone out. So I've been preaching ever since. And I left Jamaica. I was on cloud nine. And that's an understatement. I was talk about being hyper. I was hyper. I was giving the Lord high fives. I was excited. I was saying, Lord, look what you've done. You've given me the ability to preach. I've spent so much time praying. And Lord, I thank you for giving me the ability to preach because I realized that if I would build God a house of devotion, he would build me a house of ministry. So my, my focus in Bible school was to pray and to seek and to fast and ask God for an anointing. And I would always visit the president of the Bible college. His name was Wade Taylor. And uh, I'd go into his office and he'd grab a hold of my hands and he'd pray for the gift to speak and pray for the gift to write. And when I would leave his office, I would be shaking. And I could feel the impartation into my life. And I knew that now that God had done something, that I was on the road now to be able to be used of God. Well, I went on another trip to Jamaica. And that, that was a wonderful trip as well. And now I'm in my third year. Got back from Jamaica. Everything's good. And I got sick again in Bible school. Getting ready to graduate. Like five months before, five or six months before I graduated. And I was like really upset. Like, why am I sick? I was so weak I could barely walk up the stairs to get to my to get to my dormitory. And I just didn't understand. And finally my friend said, We gotta get you checked out. So they went to a little doctor uh, in, in a little town called Dodgeville. And he was a praying man. He in fact he went to the school as well. He was affiliated with it. And he began to pray over me and he said, uh, Steve, did you have uh, you know, any kind of history of diabetes or anything like that in your family or anything like that? I said, no, not that I know of. He says, well, your blood sugar is over five or 600. I think it was over 600 or higher. I'm not sure. It was really high. He says, you need to sit down. He says, we got to get you to a bigger hospital. So, sound familiar? They got me to a, got me an ambulance, got me to a bigger hospital. Doctors are working on me again, and they walk into my room, and they said, we're sorry, Steve, but you have sugar diabetes, and you're going to be insulin dependent the rest of your life. Like, whoa, insulin dependent, diabetes. I don't want to be a diabetic. I don't want to give myself insulin. I already had to take pills because my adrenal glands in India were shot. And for some reason, the Lord didn't choose to heal me of that. I believe he's going to. But my adrenal glands were absolutely destroyed while I was in India. And I had to take pills since, since I was uh, 18 years old. Now, a few years later, my pancreas goes completely destroyed. I had an autoimmune disease and it killed off my pancreas, said it wasn't my own. So there's no hope of it being restored unless God was to heal me. And I laid in that hospital room and I was just totally depressed, totally depressed. I began to trust the Lord. My parents came all the way from Ohio, Madison, Ohio, up to upstate New York, visited me, prayed for me, just like before. And I wanted God to heal me so bad. I began to ask God for healing. When I went home, I didn't leave Bible school, but I needed to take some time to just to just to get my feet uh, solid again. I didn't know all about this, these uh, carbohydrates and insulin and, and all of this stuff. I just didn't understand all of that and, and uh, diabetic diets and foot care and eye care and all kinds of stuff. I just didn't understand. And so I was home and I was depressed out of my mind. I was so depressed that literally I wanted to commit suicide. And over and over again, I kept thinking in my mind, I'm gonna go into the closet, I'm gonna grab that gun, and I'm gonna commit suicide. And I thought, no, I can't do it. I don't wanna to go to hell. And 
I know God has a purpose. I got to shut those voices out. But that's what I want to do. I was so depressed, so depressed. I was in the, I was, uh, it was the dark night of my soul. I, I, I can't even begin to describe with words how I felt. It's like, why me? I'm trying to serve God. I'm trying to preach the gospel. You're giving me a gift to speak. And now I got to get diabetes. Now I got to get sick again. This is one of like the seventh or sixth or seventh time at the time of me almost losing my life. I was so weary of it. I was so tired of it. So tired of sickness and medication and doctors and tests. So tired of it. And my mother knew that I became bitter. And she said to me, she was very wise, she said, would you just listen to this tape? And I said, I don't want to listen to no tape. She goes, just listen to this tape. And they left. They had to go somewhere. My sister was gone. My mom and dad left. And I put in that tape. And I remember laying on the couch. And as I listened to that tape, I can't even tell you anything that was said in the tape. But I had the most incredible encounter with Jesus that I've ever had up until that time. Literally, I felt the Lord come into that living room and touch me. I began to weep uncontrollably. And as I began to weep, all of the hurt from being spit at and rejected as a kid, all of the bitterness, all of the hurt, everything that I had felt, all of the rejection, everything, all of the problems and struggles and strife, all of the sicknesses and the diabetes, everything, all of it began to come out with a wail. I just began to weep. But when I was done wailing, literally, there was like a blanket of God's presence upon me. And God whispered in my ear, Steve, I have a plan for you. What Satan has meant for evil, I will bring good out of it. You need to trust me. And when, when he said that to me, all of a sudden a light went on. That all of this, these trials that I've been through weren't for nothing. But God was going to do something. He was going to use it for his glory. And I had a fresh new approach of life. I went outside. I couldn't even say, oh, I love you, Jesus, without tears. I was so soft and tender before God. Tears would come down my face. I just would weep. I'd go, thank you for the air to breathe. Thank you for feet to walk. Thank you for hands to hold you. Thank you, Lord, for a voice to speak. Thank you for health. Because see, I had so much to be thankful for. Yet, I know I went through some trials, but I had so much to be thankful for. God spared my life. I didn't die of diabetes. I waited too long to go to the doctor. I could have died, but yet God spared my life. He spared my life, and He was with me yet again. Now, has God healed me of diabetes? Not yet. I believe by faith that God's going to heal me of diabetes. I've had diabetes over 15 years, and I've been in many, many prayer lines in front of very, very many healing evangelists asking God to heal me. I fasted and I prayed. So I believe in the power of faith and prayer and asking God to heal your body. God has healed my body many times before. So there's no problem with faith and believing. But I'm trusting for that day. The day that God extends His hand forward and heals my body. That I'm totally healed of diabetes. I'm praying for that day. And I believe that day's coming. Well, after that, after that experience, I went back to Bible school and I just had a fresh new approach on life. Everywhere I went, I wanted to tell people about Jesus. I just loved him so much. And God spoke to me and said, I want you to write a book. And I said, okay, Lord, I'll write a book. What should it be called? And he said, call it Crocodile Meat. A teenager's guide to turn trials into triumph. And he took me over every scene of my life. Many of them that I've shared and some of them I haven't had time to share. But every scene of my life, and after each trial, he began to teach me valuable lessons and deeper truths from that trial. And I was amazed because God was doing a, continuing that healing work in my heart as I began to write this book. And within a year, I think it was a year, year and a half, I finished the book, Crockett on Me, and through a supernatural miracle from a blessed sister, she supplied the, the finances that I needed, and I published the book got 500 copies. I had to self-publish because I'm not a big name person. So no, no publishing company would publish my book. So I had to pay for it myself. And in my hand, I had that book. Well, to my amazement, I wrote it for teens, but to my amazement, the elderly, middle-aged people, young couples, college kids, many people began to read that book. It began to circulate here and there. I barely have any of them left um, over the years because I've either sold them or I given out most of them, I've given them away, 
And to my amazement, that book really inspired a lot of people. And I began to think, wow, God, you're using my story. Well, God began to speak to me that you can come through life and you can be bitter or better. But if you want to be better, you have to be like butter, soft and pliable. So I, I had determined in my heart that I wasn't going to be a bitter person. That I wasn't going to allow all of the situations of life, all of those things to get me down. I, I didn't want to be a person that was, that was angry and bitter toward God. I wanted to be a person that was in love with Jesus. So I made up my mind that I would be in love with Jesus. Though he slay me, still I will follow him. Joseph went through a lot of problems. Job went through a lot of problems. Daniel went through some problems. Moses had a lot of problems. Paul the Apostle, I could read to you in, in uh, Corinthians, how, how he suffered a shipwreck in the deep and all the stuff that he went through. So there's a lot, there's a lot of things the people in the Bible went through and I wasn't going to be bitter. I was going to allow my testimony to inspire other people. Well, to my amazement, I didn't realize this at the time, but God began to show me that he was going to take me all over the nation to share my story. And as I got invitations to go many places around the nation to share, I got on the full gospel businessman circuit and went everywhere sharing my story many, many places in Ohio and Pennsylvania, different places, many chapters. I remember giving it for one of the first times and a little girl, 15 years old, came forward and she began to cry. And she said, I'm a diabetic, and I've been rejected. And I saw God put her life back together, and God gave her hope. We stayed in contact after that for several years. She was a changed person. I gave altar call after altar call after my testimony was over, and hundreds, maybe even thousands now, of people received Christ into their life. I began to talk about how God took a rejected boy, someone that everybody hated. I was last on the list the list of man. I was the most least likely to succeed in my high school and God took a rejected boy that was floundering, that was suicidal, that, that according to everyone else would never amount to anything and he made me the valedictorian, the class speaker, the, an example of my college class and then take me and give me a voice to go around the nations and preach the gospel and tell other people that if God can use me, what can God do in their life? And my friend, what can God do in your life if God can take me floundering from pillar to post and turn me into a preacher? What can God do? God can reverse the curse. God can give you back double for your trouble. God can turn your scars into stars. God can take what you thought was your deepest, darkest night of the soul and turn it into a platform and a testimony so that so many other people can receive hope and healing. I didn't know that when I was being beat up and being spit at, that one day that I would be a preacher and one day that I would preach in youth conventions, one day I would preach in, and, and on conferences with adults and thousands of people would come forward and thousands of people would receive the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart or they would receive healing. Because, you know, there's a lot of people, they don't have physical diseases, but they have diseases of the soul. Wounds. Wounds into their life that so hurt them. Wounds into their heart that so hurt them. And they're carrying it around. If you could see into their soul, you would see a bruised, hurting person. But God... But God. But God. God is faithful to take what man says will never amount to anything and form it and shape it into his image and use it for his glory. I'm only standing here today. I've almost lost my life eight, nine, ten. I don't even remember how many times I was rejected, I was hurt, but God healed my heart and he's given me a testimony. I want to encourage you today, if you've gone through some hard times, even things that you didn't ask for, don't give up on God. Don't be bitter. Don't be angry. Trust in the integrity of God. 
God is using my story. God is using my story to inspire many people. I'm called to the nations. Yet Satan at a very young age, 16, 18 years old, tried to hinder that. Sometimes what you're called to do, Satan tries to just mess all of that up. Tries to mess all of that up so that you, you totally, totally don't even want to do it. But yet I knew I was called to the nations. I knew that I was called to preach. See, when I received that gift to speak, when I received that gift to preach, God spoke to me and said, Do you remember India? I said, Yes, Lord. He said, That's your strength. Now, do you see Jamaica? He said, Yes, Lord. He said, That's my strength in you. Remember where your dependency comes from. I had to learn a hard lesson of dependency. There's not a service that doesn't go by that I'm not on my knees asking the Lord for the ability to speak because there's nothing in Steve Porter there's no talent there's no ability it comes from the Father and so hard times can teach us valuable lessons hard times can create testimonies to encourage the nations your story no matter what it is can inspire somebody else don't grow weary in well-doing don't grow bitter grow better what was meant for evil God meant for good he wants to give you double for your trouble. Allow your testimony to create in you a clean heart before God. Don't question Him. Just trust Him. Believe God that He has called you and He'll be faithful to complete your calling and use your calling for the goodness of God. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the opportunity to share my testimony. Lord, I pray for those that have hurting hearts right now hearts. Heal them now in Jesus name. Heal them now in Jesus name. Even as I stand on this beach all alone overlooking Scroon Lake, I ask that your Holy Spirit, the manifest presence of God would come and touch the broken hearts. Bring healing. Healing Lord. Touch them. Oh Jesus. Oh, Jesus, healing. Touch. Those that have been rejected, let them not believe the lies of the enemy. Let them believe the Word of God. If it's not found in the Bible, if it's not what you say, it's not true. You place value on them. You love them. You desire them. And you'll turn it around for the good. Father, those that are broken, those that have gone through sickness and have asked for healing and haven't received their healing yet, let them not give up. Let them not question you and say, well, maybe God doesn't want to heal me. Yes, God wants to heal them. By faith, God wants to heal them. But until that blessed day, let them trust in you. Let them not grow bitter. But Lord, let them trust in you. Holy Spirit, touch. Touch our precious viewers right now. Thank you. Walk into the room with them right now. Literally walk in the room like you walked in the room with me and healed my heart that day. The day I was suicidal, you walked in the room. Deliver them from all their fears, all their pain. Yes. Touch. Jesus name. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for allowing me to share my story with you. It's my, one of my favorite sermons to give. And uh, I'm so glad that I was able to give it in beautiful Scroon Lake. The sun is up. We still got some uh, fog over the mountains. And uh, I'm going to have a good time with my family. I'm going to go boating today. And my girls are going to go swimming. And we might do a little tubing. Last time I went tubing, I got sore 
all over it. Some of you have been tubing, you know what I'm saying. I don't know if I'm going to be tubing or not, but we may try tubing and uh, we're going to do all kinds of fun things today. And I'm enjoying my family, enjoying my vacation, and so glad that I was able to spend some time with you on the vacation. And uh, until next week, uh, when we do part six to the wilderness, Lord willing, we'll, we'll see you then. God bless you. Soak in the Spirit. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen. Thank you for watching. God bless you.